If you weren't aware, I love classic Castlevania. These games are all masterpieces to me. Okay, well, maybe not. But I am a member of a Castlevania 2 defense force, and I think it's pretty alright. And while the first Game Boy Castlevania is kind of a mess, the second one is amazing and you're all sleeping on it. But Castlevania was a staple of old Nintendo systems, and for PC Engine CD, and for Mega Drive, and we can't forget about the Game Gear and Master System. I'm sure you're confused by that statement, unless you looked at the video's title. Actually, no, that's even more confusing. Okay, I just need to explain. In the late 80s and early 90s, Castlevania was a big feather in Nintendo's cap, so why not just rip it off whole hog and give it a less appealing name? Or better yet, multiple less appealing names since Master of Darkness was known in North America as Vampire Master of Darkness. And then you take this bootleg and you put it on Sega's Master System and Game Gear. This game has been largely forgotten by most outside a single 3DS Virtual Console release of the Game Gear version specifically. And the frankly better Master System release is a largely forgotten relic. For context of where the Castlevania series was when Master of Darkness first grazed the Sega systems, this was long before Sega got its own Castlevania game. This really was their closest approximation, even if it's a weird footnote now. And this is really obvious when you read reviews from Sega magazines back in the day. Sega Power starts by saying this is like Castlevania, which is a Nintendo thingy, and then on it can't stop mentioning how it's actually like Ninja Gaiden. Though that is as strange as it might sound, since they're referring to the Master System Ninja Gaiden game, which was actually developed by the same company that did Master of Darkness. But to get back onto where Castlevania was, Super Castlevania 4 was the newest entry at this stage, and for handheld players, the excellent Belmont's Revenge was still new as well. So Master of Darkness basically had to stand up against these two titans, and in some ways it succeeded. Graphically, this no doubt outdoes the Game Boy's attempts. But I'd go as far to say this also surpasses the 8-bit Castlevanias of the time. There's no objectivity here. I won't fault people for finding the NES Castlevanias more appealing, and I lost all my credibility ages ago. But to me, Master of Darkness has more detailed sprites and better color choices. At the very least, it doesn't look as drab. But that might just be because of our protagonist's bright blue suit. On Game Gear, you'll get a great look at it too, because of a trademark tight zoom, which was basically a hardware requirement. Thankfully, since Castlevania was a slow-paced game, a tighter zoom isn't the death sentence it was for some other Game Gear conversions of Master System titles. This version will do. And obviously it's the version I'm covering, because my obsession is taking over me and I can't touch a regular home console without breaking out into a rash. But if you're curious, the Master System version has way more screen real estate, slightly different and generally better level design, and boss arenas make great use of the extra space available. Between that and the fact that bosses now have health bars on this version, which is a godsend, the home console release is without a doubt the version more people will prefer. And if you're curious as to why I'm not primarily talking about it, hey it's nice to meet you, I'm Freezer. Game Gear it is. But don't fret, without direct competition, this is still a great way to play it, and it only starts to look weak when directly compared to its more polished version. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have opened up the video like that. Now you have to go over the whole rest of the video tainted with the knowledge that there is a better version out there. Just no screen crunch is never an issue here. It's perfectly designed with a smaller screen size in mind, it's just that the Master System has extra room, which is a nice bonus, instead of a necessity that is required to properly enjoy it. I know none of you will play this game anyway, but if you ever do, like I somehow infect your subconscious and years later you act upon it, I would honestly recommend playing both versions to see their differences. This Game Gear release is no slouch, and it is a more impressive title considering this was a handheld game from 1992. You could play this outside your house for minutes at a time before you change batteries. In those minutes of play, we get to slay monsters as Dr. Ferdinand Social. Which certainly is a name. 
He wants to murder Dracula, which is to be expected, and with the power of Ouija board technology, he begins this quest. Surprisingly, this game doesn't limit its story to the manual. We get story sequences in the game itself, and these are surprisingly well done and will be used to set up each level and link them all together. Starting in the streets of Victorian England, specifically the River Thames, we get a great idea of how social plays, and it's wonderful. It's like a weird mix of Ness and SNES Castlevania. We get full jumping a troll, and a slightly larger focus on platforming that makes good use of it, and we do our primary attacks, which are just a straight line of death that we can't aim. And we have secondary attacks that we get with pickups that rely on limited ammo that we also occasionally find. This is activated with a combination of up on the D-pad and our attack button. It might just be easier to say this plays like the Ness Castlevanias, with the jumping control being an outlier. And when he's crouching, we can make him do the duck walk. Thankfully, the knockback here isn't as cruel and your health is plentiful, so this is a much more laid-back and easy-going experience. Things are generally more generous here, and it's a more welcoming Castlevania to newcomers, but for a veteran of a series, this makes a fun twist on the formula, even if I doubt it would top anyone's list of favourite games in this style. The River Thames stage is a perfect opening level. It naturally introduces everything you need to know, while giving us an aesthetic not really seen in similar titles. We start off with a pitiful dagger. This weapon has no range and it's very weak. It's almost like a joke weapon, but it's fair to greet you on new playthroughs or every time you come back after losing a life. Thankfully, there are three main weapons that just outdo this, and they're all fantastic. And best of all, they're kind of balanced around each other. So there isn't really a best weapon here, even if it's easy to have preferences. Though the worst weapon is undeniably the dagger. It has no range and poor attack. The other weapons like Saber, Stake, and Axe all balance their strength around their range. The Axe has a range as poor as the daggers, but it is super powerful. The Saber has a huge range, but it's pretty weak. And the Stake is a middle ground between them. The only problem with this system is you can only have one weapon at a time, and they swap out once you touch another weapon pickup. And you can't go back to your earlier weapons, so you might accidentally brush up against a new weapon and trade it. This itself could be excused, but the dagger is in rotation, so you could easily replace your good weapon with a terrible one, and sometimes the placements feel deliberate. They knew what they were doing. Even the instruction manual on multiple occasions advises you to be careful. But being careful sucks because I'm impatient and I want a high score. Oh yeah, the manual has areas to fill in your high score, that's cute. One downside of the developer's thinking score mattered is we get the Mega Man 1 style score pellets in the grab bag of collectibles. So sometimes you might want more health or better weapons, but instead you get more points for your score. While this whole system is a pain, I'll admit that I've replayed this game like half a dozen times just to get footage here, and if I was only a tiny bit more pathetic, scores would be something I'd be interested in. This is such a replayable and short game, I don't blame them for attempting this. Especially since the target audience would be kids, who would only have a small handful of games themselves, and couldn't just get something new the minute they beat a game. Still, I'd rather not see it obtained to these globe items. It's just a nuisance. And what even are these in this universe? The manual just says they're magic globes. The items all make some kind of sense. Life potions heal, voodoo dolls are extra lives and I won't get into the whole problematic elements of that again, but at least there was something there. But globes? It was so bad Sega Force Magazine wrote that these were garlic, which also doesn't make sense, but hey, it's something. They also called the stake a hammer, which does make some sense due to how it's swung. Most people online I see it just call it a cane nowadays, but I do like how some magazines like this and Mean Machine got the idea that this is a ridiculously long hammer. Ignoring all that, everything else at this early stage is worthy of praise. This world feels alive, with all this background movement, and the early game enemies just being regular dudes and dogs is explained away as them being thugs and werewolves. The manual is really cute, it tries to explain everything, including the horribly evil AI of the bat enemies, 
It's also how I know this bridge is specifically London Bridge. Other than sightseeing, we have a game in this game. We get introduced to classic Castlevania stairs. They're indistinguishable here, but we do at least see where Dr. Social lands on the Belmont stair scale. He has to get on them from the top or bottom, much like the older entries, but he can at least jump off the stairs early, and this speeds up the pace of the game and also keeps Social from being helpless every time stairs are present. It's a nice compromise between the deliberate limitations of early outings and the stairs being basically nothing in Castlevania 4. Because of this, stairs are never a mess, and thanks to the designers not being evil, extremely tall levels aren't death traps either like you'd expect. If the player falls down to what should be an earlier section of a stage, it isn't fatal, it just sends you back to the earlier screen. I can't stress how nice a feature this is. You don't die if you fall three feet because the edge of a screen is what determines your death. Death is only determined by your very large health bar and the few death pits that are obviously death pits. You shouldn't ever find yourself surprised a pit was fatal. It's all pretty well telegraphed. Like don't jump in this water, or don't fall into the pits inside this cave section. That cave is part of the second level's varied landscape. Sorry, I meant to call it the second round. Each round contains three levels and ends with a boss fight. And that's the terminology I'll be using from here on out. Simply put, it's Castlevania 1, which had blocks of levels that would culminate with a boss at the end of each. Round 1 was the River Thames, and it ended with a fight against Jack the Ripper. After some brief exposition, we're led to Round 2, the House of Wax Dolls. My feelings on this are a bit all over the place. I love the aesthetic. It's part underground cave system and part beautiful mansion. It's especially nice seeing this not be some kind of decrepit ruins, like you'd expect from another game that I'll try not to mention anymore. This looks lived in and current for the setting. The walls are adorned with priceless works of art and their identical duplicates, and poltergeists inhabit inanimate objects like tables and chairs, so these become enemies too, which is really novel. In some ways, this is my favourite round of the game. But Dracula's magic has brought some wax dolls to life, and while some of them are just still dolls that won't harm you, the living ones can, but they can't be defeated until they spring to life. And that won't happen until you walk past them, so it leads to a lot of moments where you just have to walk, stop, turn around, attack, and then continue walking in the original direction. It's a bit of a pace breaker, and any excitement of these living wax dolls dissipated quickly for me. I want less of them, and more evil candelabras to kill, sorry. With all that said, killing is at least very satisfying in this game. Your weapons are quick, and everything explodes into dust. And this is good, because House of Wax Dolls introduces some challenge rooms where we're basically locked in and have to defeat all the enemies that spawn in, or in some later twists to this formula in a different round, we have to defeat a specific enemy by navigating our way there and defending ourselves en route. These are really fun ideas, and it's generally really well executed, even if it did come as a shock to me, since this isn't exactly a hallmark of a game they're copying. These rooms and the boss arenas have to both encompass the total screen size without panning to side to side, so these are the most dramatically different sections between Game Gear and Master System. Both have their merits, the larger amount of freedom and room to maneuver are appealing on console, no doubt. Though I also do personally love the claustrophobic feeling on Game Gear. You're locked in a small room with things that want you dead. There is one issue, however, with these rooms. They blare very loud and repetitive alarm sounds, which is annoying on its own right, but worst of all, it replaces the music. And my god, the music is good here. You know, it's not great, it's not the best of the best deserving of the highest honours, but it's an underappreciated soundtrack full of constant jams that infest my brain as earworms. They're all very derivative of that vampire killing series, but who cares? Being inspired by legends is a good thing. And whenever these are interrupted for an alarm, it depresses me. It's also the exact moment my partner tells me to turn down the volume because it went from fun background noise to a nuisance. I feel like that will be a recurring thing in my next video too. One other sensory annoyance in this game is the screen nuke. It's these white emeralds, 
just touching it kills every enemy on screen and flashes multiple bright lights in quick succession. It is at its best a slight annoyance, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is a trigger for people's epilepsy. The 90s really hated people, didn't they? Something that is never a nuisance is our sub-weapons. They're all great, and while they vary in power and range, they each use unique ammo, so weaker ones are generally found more often and have more ammo to use per pickup. I tend to hoard these, and since they carry over between stages and only reset upon death, it's easy to exploit this with careful play. The pistol is the most basic one, and in some ways it's my favourite just because the idea of shooting enemies with a regular gun is kind of amusing to me in a game like this. Though these silver bullets aren't that effective all things considered, it's mostly just there as a super long range weapon with lots of ammo to spare. The detonating mechanism is my actual favourite, and not just because of its name, though I do love it. It lobs upwards and detonates in glorious fashion, and the explosion lingers on screen just long enough that it can deal with unintended targets like all the enemies that decide to walk into an explosion. We also have the boomerang too, which is also nice. It does what you'd expect except for the fact that you can't catch it. But if you read the manual, you're told you shouldn't worry about it because it does so much damage. The manual also graces us with the glorious flavour text and the name of the final of these four sub-weapons. Projectile. This item does four points of damage to enemies. This carried over to the Master System release, and every language in the European manual got an equivalent to the same name and description. It's inescapable. Despite that, I love how these are all handled. Like I said, less ammo is given to the stronger weapons. The pistol gives you 16 ammo per pickup, and the detonating mechanism is 8. It helps make the game feel like there is no wrong sub-weapon, since the ones that do less damage are able to be used way more often. The projectile isn't even available until near the end of the game, so it feels like a spectacle just to have it. Speaking of the end of the game, we're almost halfway there. But before going on to round 3, I just need to compliment the House of Wax dolls for ending with an outside section, complete with being on rooftops. If nothing else, this game is visually speaking imaginative and constantly fresh. Now round 3 kind of ruins that. Okay, I kid. This level 2 has a lot of variety. It starts in a cemetery, and it turns into very different locales. But come on, be more subtle if you're copying. The church sections are nice. While they're nice to look at, the level design isn't at its best here, and it's another area the master system improved upon with better level design. But none of this matters, because we get a clockwork section with all these gears and giant moving pendulums to platform on. This is the most blatant copying I've seen. I don't mind, it's fun here, and it actually works really well with the better jumping control. But once we make our way to the top of this church, we follow the enemy's lead and jump off. Just be careful not to jump all the way to the right. We land on some clock hands and we have another boss fight. And if you actually read the story sequences, this one is really nice. And if not, you'll wonder who this blonde guy is and be annoyed to see him in the next stage too. Round 4 is in a laboratory, and I much prefer this aesthetic. It's very much part of the classic horror tropes, but feels fresh in a game of this nature. And leading up to this wonderful lab is a forest section where the wildlife just wants you dead. Enjoy it while it lasts, because once you enter the castle, oh yeah, this laboratory is in a castle, you won't be seeing outside locales again. The climax is nearly here, and this game earns it with constantly changing landscapes, so it feels like a real journey from London city streets to this castle in the woods. We get some more fun platforming here with these rotating electrical orbs. Honestly, I wish this was more fleshed out and we saw it more often. And we have a return of the inanimate wax dolls that come to life, which isn't my favourite thing. And that's because this level feels like a final exam on everything we've learnt thus far. So it's here we get the return of the alarm blaring rooms from round 2, obviously. While it's fair to call this the last traditional set of stages, round 5 is still a blast. It directly takes place after the end of round 4, with Social now escaping the dungeon cell he was locked into during that narrative sequence. This entire round is just one level, and on top of it, it's a maze. That's why I don't label this as traditional. 
but it's somehow not a tedious mess to explore. It's a short looping maze with distinct layouts, so it's easy to navigate, and to me, it was at least fun to solve. Once completed, we have the two-phase final boss fight, and to start with, I adore the first phase. It's hectic, but makes great use of the tight platforming, as we need to rise to the correct height to strike this vampire who just won't play fair. The second phase is fine too, though it's the kind where we dodge various projectiles, get a shot in, and then wait for another opportunity to attack. Anyway, Dracula is defeated in the credits play of a Ouija board, which is just a cool thematic touch, and a great way to bookend this game. And with that, Master of Darkness draws to a close. It's a pretty great game for both pieces of hardware lucky enough to have it, and it holds up well against its inspiration. It plays really well too, with smart changes to the basis and careful consideration to the level design to not make this jump feel overpowered. Though the biggest weakness in the overall execution is unfortunately some of the level design. A lot of it is great, and what isn't is fairly standard. But on occasion, especially in the second half, layouts don't always make the most sense, or can be a little confusing. The manual justifies it with a nice cover, but even if it was intentional and nice world building, it doesn't make the most fun layouts for a video game of this genre. But that's it, my biggest issue. On a few small occasions in the latter half, some layouts aren't ideal. And that's cause this is a great game at the end of the day. Sure, it's derivative, but I don't care. I love the games it's emulating. I'm a huge Castlevania fan. Though I must specify, a classic Castlevania fan. I've never played any of those exploration-focused ones. That might change soon, but I'm getting my first taste of search action elsewhere, because next video is on Metroid Zero Mission. It's my first time playing this series. I finally gave in to all the people demanding I play it for well over a decade now. And at the time of speaking, I've already beaten it twice. So it turns out, maybe all those people yelling at me had a point after all.